You're listening to the RN Mentor, a podcast designed to document and bring you the work and experience of some of the most influential nurses in our profession. We will be sitting down and having a discussion with the leaders of today's nursing world as they share their work, how they navigate their nursing path, and their views on the future of the profession. My name is Ali Tayeb. I am a registered nurse, United States Navy veteran, a Jonas Veterans Healthcare Scholar, and your host for the RN Mentor. And welcome to another episode of the RN Mentor Podcast. I'm super excited uh, today to be joined by Dr. Josh uh, Weimer. Uh, Dr. Weimer is an accomplished nurse, team-oriented clinical operations leader, and forward-looking health information executive with more than 25 years in healthcare. His present roles include founding chief clinical officer for Shift Hive Inc. and chief product officer for Medical Match Inc., Dr. Weimer also serves in various advisory roles for other startups and accelerators while teaching advanced informatics, executive nurse leadership, and evidence-based practice. With an undergraduate degree in nursing from Seattle University, Dr. Weimer completed a Master's of Science in Nursing in Healthcare Informatics with the University of San Diego, a Master's of Science in Project Management from Granite State College, a Master's of Arts in Enterprise Strategic Planning from the U.S. Naval War College and a Doctor of Nursing Practice in Executive Leadership from Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Weimer recently completed a successful 20-plus year career in the U.S. Navy that included three combat zone deployments and direct support to multinational forces and special operations missions. Dr. Weimer's military awards and decorations include the Navy and Marine Corps Accommodation Medal, three awards on that one, Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal, four awards, as well as other meritorious awards and citations. Dr. Weimer is a proud member of the College of Healthcare Information Management Executives and holds the Healthcare Chief Information Officer and Digital Health Executive credentials. His additional credentials include perioperative nursing, nursing informatics, and as an advanced nurse executive. As a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives, he previously served on the editorial board for Healthcare Executives Magazine and mentors early career healthcare executives. As a fellow with the American Academy of Nursing, Dr. Weimer, is recognized advocate for digital health transformation, human-centered design, and peer collaborations across interprofessional teams. His recent uh, peer-reviewed work has focused on executive leadership interprofessional teams and empowering clinicians. Dr. Weimers currently serves as vice president, board of directors, competency and credentialing institute, representing more than 42,000 perioperative nurses and surgical services professionals. He also serves on the advisory board for the Association for Executives in Healthcare Applications, Data Analytics, and on the North American Advisory Panel for Analytics with the Healthcare Information and Management System Society. Welcome to the show, Dr. Weimer. Thank you so very much. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you. When do you have time for anything else? Degrees, credentials, boards? Um, how do you do you have any free time? I'm um, thank you for having free time to actually meet with me. I should say that. <laughs> well, it's an honor to be here, obviously, and, and it's good to see you again, Ali. I I think that when we think about where we are in healthcare and what we do as nurses uh, and as healthcare leaders, I think when you have passion and you have an opportunity to make a difference, it doesn't feel like work. And so I think that that would be my response that everything I do has value or passion for myself. And I hope for uh, the patients and communities that I care about. And and that's what drives uh, that engagement. I appreciate that. Uh, and I appreciate you. And for, for our listeners, uh, uh, Dr. Weimer, I'm going to call him Josh because he likes it that way. Uh, him and I, uh, and I, we've known each other for a few years. We initially met through social media, had the privilege of meeting you in person multiple times, and uh, and I appreciate the work that you do. And uh, I'm before I uh, and and 
Uh, we have the Navy in con connection also. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to start with how did you get started in the world of nursing, which is what I always ask my my guests is how did you get started? Uh, and if you can uh, uh, maybe for you, it's like really healthcare because you started in healthcare before really you started in the nursing. Sure. So thank you uh, for the opportunity to discuss. I, I think we all have such unique journeys to healthcare and nursing. Mine began uh, right after high school working as a uh, nursing assistant while paying for nursing school. And there's nothing more humbling and satisfying than providing direct uh, full care, right, to the uh, populations of either rehabilitation or long-term care. And that really tested uh, my resolve or desire for the profession. And, and when 9-11 happened, I think for many of us who were uh, you know, involved in that uh, experience in our country's history, I I was very much uh, influenced by that and decided to join the military. And I think that my journey as a corpsman in the Navy and ultimately receiving my commission uh, five years later and then growing through med surge, a decade in the operating room and then health information, I think what, I, what I'm most taken by is the chance we have to make a difference every time. And I think that's what's driven every step along the way is I can make more impact or be a bigger uh, uh, difference here. Maybe I can strengthen my advocacy, my influence, my contribution to healthcare as a whole. And that's really what brought us here today, right, is the, first of all, uh, a compulsive uh, yes, right? When opportunity arises, you need to say yes for that first opportunity to build the momentum. But ultimately, that just desire to make a difference and and be an advocate for patients everywhere we go. Thank you. Uh, and by the way, thank you for your service. Um, I, I didn't mention, I like to, uh, when I meet fellow veterans, I, I like to uh, give that because it's not everybody who decides to volunteer. We are all volunteer military. So I like to, it's not everybody that actually goes through that process and understands. And I, there's a com camaraderie between us that, uh, that goes, goes through that process. Um, now you mentioned, uh, um, real quick, I, and I always love talking to people I already know, because I always find out things I didn't know. I didn't know you were in nursing school before you joined, like you got out, when 9-11 happened and you ended up actually joining the military as an enlisted individual, not as a nurse, but you became a corpsman. And that's another thing we have in common. We're both corpsmen and Navy. Uh, I'm older, uh, but uh, but so my my service predates your service about a decade. Uh, but um, but for you, uh, you, how did, so what was your influence to actually go and become a nurse what was that influence because it was pre your corpsman experience i always assumed like you were a corpsman and you said hey i'm going to go get a commission as a nurse but you already you had that influence prior to that well i think i it's it's fascinating right and, and it's interesting how our professional roles and our experiences are initially shaped by our personalities and our kind of individual interests and i i know that i've always had a decently strong personality and thought of where I was going in life. And, you know, nursing presented a real opportunity to make a difference for others. I grew up very much enjoying being around uh, individuals and those in my community. I enjoyed serving and making a difference. Um, and, and so for me, the thought that, um, you know, nursing is somehow lesser than other professions in healthcare, I have encountered that um, uh, in nursing. But I think it's fascinating because as a new nurse, uh, many years into my journey, what, uh, seven years into my journey in healthcare, I remember sitting there as a charge nurse at the nurse's station on a med surge inpatient unit in an academic teaching hospital and wondering how the medical students and residents allowed themselves to be treated they were the way they were by their attendings. And I just, I remember sharing words of encouragement to especially those that were adding a lot of value for me and my teams. And I just remember thinking it's a good thing I decided to become a nurse because I would not have tolerated <laughs> the legacy 
uh, medicine training model, if you will. Yeah. Um, and I think I think that that's something that you know it, is, it also reflects in me uh, pursuing the military. I knew that I wanted to make a difference after 9/11. I think there were a lot of emotions around that date, but I think after that date, it becomes purpose. And you see that with a lot of individuals and communities that go through traumatic events, significant events in their in their experience. It moves from a emotional and a very personal experience into a constructive desire to change or, or, or make a difference. And so to me, I think that that's what ultimately pushed me into the military. And while I like to think of myself as a very non-traditional uh, member of the military, I kept that in the spirit, independent spirit, which I know very much defines who you are. And again, thank you for your service and, and contributions to our country. I think that I think that when we think about that, we should never, we need to remember this uh, when we work with our teams, we should never make an assumption about anyone in our team and how they arrived where they are today or where they may go tomorrow. And I think that's an incredibly important piece of what we can all bring uh, as nurses and as good people uh, to the healthcare team. Well, I appreciate that. Um, and, and you touch on a very uh, important topic, and I want to talk to you about this. Uh, I'm, I wrote it down because I'm going to come back to it. Um, you mentioned uh, that the, the component of purpose, right? Sure. Um, and that's something that I think uh, something that most people that are in the military uh, miss, uh, when they leave the military and they transition out. I just want to touch on your transitioning out of the military because uh, I think that's, we have, you know, nurses and uh, service members actually listen to the show. And I think it's it's important that we hear more about how service members transition out of the military. How was your transition out of the military and how did that component of purpose shift for you? Well, and, and that's a profound question. Uh, we could sit here for a long time and talk about what I think in a in a nutshell, I think that uh, I've always been someone who looks three, five years ahead and plans. Um, I was very fortunate in my career to have supportive leaders in almost every circumstance and experience um, to be able to reframe even the most challenging experiences into positive ones. Um, but I can tell you that, you know, the COVID experience as a nurse, um, was harder than any combat zone experience I ever had in my life. I can tell you that this transition in retirement, while very fortunate, I've had the privilege to obtain degrees, um, have profound experiences that inform my resume. Um, I'm very busy. It's still definitely a, a change. It is a it is a transition in the truest sense of. Uh, you do need to know where you're going and you might need to remind yourself, even if you're somebody who's very strong with that North Star. But I think that that's where I feel very fortunate to be in healthcare and be a nurse because we are that bridge between the science and the art of healing and healthcare. And I think that when we really think about um, our ability to make a difference, we can make a difference anywhere in the world. And, you know, I'm committed to continuing to contribute at the highest level that I can and having that broad impact that, that I know I can have, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be uh, easy or that the next step readily identifies itself. So I think the biggest piece I would say to anyone listening who might be relating to what I'm saying is just say yes to that next thing that has interest and aligns with your passions, because it will be an important piece for whatever that ultimate destination is. And while I, I'm a little skeptical about being there, there being ultimate destinations, uh, it'll be a part of that critical component of getting you to the next step uh, in your journey. Great. Thank you for that. Um, and I think it's also important that I also bring up what was the process for you or what was, what are, the, what are, because you, you just recently retired out of the Navy. What was the, it, what was the process or the barriers for you or is the are the barriers for you as you're transitioning uh, into the civilian sector? Well, first of all, I want to emphasize that I, I feel very fortunate. Um, you know, I, I was able to leave the service 
uh, as a healthy person, uh, my sacrifices, my, well, my family and those I cared about sacrificed quite a bit. I feel like I came through very fortunately. Um, and I know that I've been very fortunate from an education perspective, a professional roles perspective. But what I think is so important to, is to realize that everyone has gravity in their life um, and everyone, everyone encounters uh, obstacles. And, and I would not put my obstacles uh, alongside some that I see, but I would say that I feel like you, you need to be prepared and know yourself. And if, I think if you can center yourself around, you know, some passions that you might have, finding ways to contribute, you know, I, I am, uh, I really enjoyed over these last few years writing, um, sharing my perspective. I've enjoyed uh, contributing in nonprofit leadership. I love the startup, uh, kind of the dangerous space of uh, you're not getting paid for your idea yet, but it could be a very uh, important contribution to healthcare or uh, bettering uh, circumstances for uh, humankind as a whole. Um, but I think that when you look at specific things, you know, there's an emotional component of you belonged to something uh, that you derived personal value from and you gave a lot to for many years when you're in the military, even if it's two, three, four years, or if it's 20 some, like 20 plus like I did, or I'm sure there's someone listening to this uh, this um, conversation that has many more years than I was fortunate to serve. And I think it doesn't just uh, relate to the military. I think anyone who's contributed to an organization for a long time, and I think about all those who, you know, especially in non-healthcare professions, may have given 20, 30, 40 years of their life to a corporation and then find themselves... I mean, I left voluntarily. <laughs> I I had plenty of opportunity. I chose to go to the door because I wanted to move to the next phase in my journey, uh, professionally and personally. Think about those folks that and entire communities that are shown the door, and they love the institution uh, that they were employed by. They they gave their all and their everything quite uh, quite often too much for too long, uh, and then all of a sudden they're forced uh, to go seek. Uh, something that they would never have chosen on their own. So to me, I think it is, it's about centering yourself. It's about knowing where you want to go, but also don't forget your physical health, right? I think uh, whatever your routine is and whatever it is that makes you happy and sustains you and keeps uh, everything moving in your life, you, you've got to focus on that. Uh, and and the other bit will take care of itself. It just involves the the one component of us as humans that it you know separates us in some ways from, the rest of nature, very few of us are patient. <laughs> and so I would encourage folks, whether you're a civilian or you're, you're, um, you're in the military, uh, you know, trust the process in that, you know, that you're doing your best every day, you're growing, um, you're doing something to grow every week, month, uh, quarter, year to grow yourself personally, professionally, academically, uh, it'll happen. You just got to be, you just go on a little bit of a journey. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and, 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 um, a lot of what you're talking, talking about, uh, resonates with me. Um, one last question, uh, with your, with your transition process, uh, I'm assuming you're applying for roles in different positions. In addition to your entrepreneurial, uh, uh, work that you're doing, um, what has your or have you had any experiences where you will where you've said to yourself the civilian community doesn't really understand what skill set I'm bringing after serving in the military or they don't really understand how to work with veterans in the civilian sector have you had those experiences so I think that's a super fair question. And I think that for sure that there's a barrier there, right? Um, I think you could blame the military and veterans for that in part, because we don't do very well at pulling back the veil on our skill set. Uh, and we're part of an institution, uh, i.e. Uh, the military, when we're uh, in uh, government service and serving our country, uh, that does not thrive on openness or sharing <laughs> their processes um, whether it be for valid uh, national security reasons or otherwise. And so I think that 
the other part would be is that we, you highlight something that's so important. Every human is on a journey to be understood and to understand. And I think that there are assumptions made on every side of the fence, and there aren't just two sides of a fence if you want to get philosophical, uh, that, that there are assumptions made by, as we look across at each other, no matter what our roles are, and it doesn't matter which industry we're in, we make assumptions. And I think that that's important to live uh, who you are um, and and be willing to pull back that curtain a little bit because I lean into the conversation. I have been asked the question, you know, you found success in military service leadership and, and a, uh, in a very linear hierarchical organization. How are you going to transition to leading at this senior strategic level within our nationally ranked health system. And I think that that's a really, for the military person, that's really easy to understand because for us, we understand the the kind of um, uh, cultural clashes we experience between the service branches, uh, between um, our civilian contractors, our government service employees, and the fact that at my last uh, tour of duty, we had three unions that were fulfilling uh, staffing roles at, at that academic teaching hospital. So when you think about it, I have equivalent experience to anyone who's in a large man managed care system. It's on me to help explain that um, uh, to the individual asking me the question, because they're, they're, they're using that lens uh, from their perspective. And I think it's our obligation. I think veterans need to own that journey, and especially own, own the skepticism, own own the questions that come at you, and, and don't internalize them. It's not about you. <laughs> it's about that organization wants to succeed, and you just need to introduce them to the skills you have uh, when they might not understand the codes, the acronyms, or the like that we love to use. Yeah, that's very true. And actually translating what you do in the military to, to verbiage that is more civilian, so the civilian counterparts can really understand uh, your skills. And that's something like I see with some of the people that I work with, and they ask me to look at their resumes or their portfolios. And the part that's usually missing almost every time is the experiences they've had in the military, right? Because they can't, just like, well, I did this, that doesn't translate. And I have to help them translate that piece as to what it means. They're like, oh, I never thought about it like that. Well, and, and if you look at, I mean, I think this applies actually to a lo any large corporation in America, but and that's fundamentally what the military branches are. They're large corporations pursuing self-interest, trying to maintain their funding, um, et cetera. I think that we really do, in addition to serving our country, obviously, but to me, I think that what we really need to do is help identify those skill sets, right? In explaining to other OR nurses, you know, um, what I had an opportunity to do with uh, the Navy SEALs or leading a surgical team in Afghanistan or uh, being in uh, the Middle East or North Africa with any number of opportunities, it really is exactly the equivalent of the operational picture they do. It's just we were picked up and put down in all these different environments. And I think that when we think about how to message our success, it's, it's not any different than the civilian sector in the sense of, you know, we, we learn and we share the skills we gain, especially around trauma um, and anything involving kinetic forces from military and combat. It benefits civilian trauma dramatically, right? Because at replicating trauma at scale from uh, combat is, is not something that is typically seen in the civilian sector. But then I go and talk to friends from major metropolitan areas and level one trauma centers and crime in this country is not um, is not uh, is not a, a non factor in their practice. Right? right. They they see multiple gunshot wounds at the same time on a routine basis. They have similar um, strategic and operational imperatives against communities uh, with vast uh, needs. And, and so I, I think we just try to learn from the best practices we all bring to the equation and, 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 and move forward, uh, to the benefit of everyone. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, 
So let's transition back to you uh, and the yeah. career that uh, that you have you have built uh, thus far. So uh, talk to me about your you you brought this up of the like the um, sort of the entrepreneurial uh, like the idea generation that you don't exactly know is going to make any money, but you're putting a lot of energy into it, right? Yeah. Um, so let's, how, how did this come about? Uh, where did, when did you decide like this was a piece that, cause we know there's a lot of nursing sort of put in this, uh, uh, to this, to this, uh, really, uh, small box of what you can do and what you can't do. And we're seeing more and more nurses like take the initiative of trying to, trying to break out of the, of the box and sort of do these additional things that aren't necessarily traditional. I'm doing air quotes right now uh, with with, uh, the traditional what nurses do. And nursing is always like, oh, you're bedside, you're in the OR, you're in the ER, but you're doing doing this other uh, sort of avenue of work uh, that you've uh, developed over the years and you continue to do. Um, What brought that on and what keeps you going in that arena? And thank you for that question. I think, I think that there's an incredible opportunity for everyone to make a difference. I think you, nursing is uniquely equipped to leverage our skills. Right? Uh, we are at the bedside. We are patient, community facing, in a way that no other profession is at scale or otherwise. And we have the ability to see. Um, you know, i.e. identify, isolate, evaluate, analyze, document, and pursue any uh, challenge we face, why not make that about an idea to make a workflow or a technology better serve doing the most good for the greatest number of people? And there's nothing more painful in healthcare right now than workforce. And so I think it has been that way for some time. Uh, So when you you have your own creative ideas, you are engaging with your employer or with supportive agencies or other resources that bring you teams for your daily operations. Look at that through your own lens and your own experience and how could it be better? And then have the gumption or the gall, <laughs> some would say, uh, to think that you might be able to change it. Um, I have never been someone... I mean, if you're waiting for for, for permission, <laughs> uh, nobody's going to come along and just tap you with a permission wand. It just doesn't happen, right? So and, I, and I think that what we really need to do is give ourselves permission. And I'd like to take this right back right now, though, to nursing itself. Because while we might be able to fall back on some sort of legacy leadership model that did put us in a corner, we have a unique body of knowledge. We have a growing distinct body of nursing science and nursing knowledge. Our implementation science is done at a scale that no other profession can deliver. We have the ability to test our own unique uh, science in, at a scale and a pace that no other profession uh, can do. Uh, we also have the ability to really, really, really see how any number of other contributions impact our care directly, like right there with the patient experiencing it. So is the patient experience, um, you know, this whole concept of human-centered design, which I've written about, become quite passionate about through my involvement with technology and innovation and transformation and healthcare of the future, uh, the nurse is ideal to be in, in that environment, right? And uh, Ian Hargraves is a famous human-centered design uh, um, theorist and and professional and and uh, Ian stated that you know human centered design is the mattering of people and to participating in the mattering of people is to care. Well, who cares? Nurses care, right? <laughs> and so we are the original human centered design business. I mean, before there was even the concept, right? And it had been formalized into uh, this collection of skills uh, and and efforts that are known as human centered design. We, we've been doing it. And, and when we think about, you know, our core values, whether it be human dignity, integrity, autonomy, altruism, social justice, all the things that we use as a lens, uh, who better to drive innovation and change than a nurse? I mean, I, it's hard to compete with that. 
But I think we do need to go back to ourselves because you hear nurses all the time say this pretty tired phrase, and I'm going to use air quotes right now, nothing about us without us. And they typically say that around the time for union negotiations. <laughs> um, but I would like us to flip that on its head. And I would like us to use it on ourselves because how many times have we walked into a meeting and there are 20, 30, 40, 60 nurses and there's no one else represented. Mm -hmm. And we know that to us, if a, another group of professionals were getting together in the hospital and there were 40 or 60 or even 10 of them, and they're not considering the perspective of a nurse, they're missing something. So it's pretty arrogant of nurses to think that we can solve this, all 60 of us, because we've got 60 minds, right? Um, right? But we didn't bother to include anybody else. And so I think taking this full circle and going back to the individual nurse, why not you? Why not now? Um, Trish Sievert, a dear friend of mine who put me up for the academy, she she basically pushed me to apply for the American Academy of Nursing. <laughs> uh, and I had no idea she was about to pass from a, a terminal illness. And uh, she said, why not you? Why not now? And I think that that's so important, right? To truly own our journey and really understand uh, that we can do this ourselves. And I think there are a couple other concepts there uh, that I would like to just dig into one specifically. And I think it was in Critical Care Nursing, the journal, um, two or three years ago, Stephanie Meyer talked about how the concept that nurses and especially the nurse as a leader, um, we have an obligation to understand that uh, agreement and support are not the same thing, right? So I may not agree with you. I might not have the same perspective. I might not have that lens that's going to make you go out there and conquer some new field or invent that piece of equipment or redesign a process but I can, I can support you. Um, it's the same thing for our leadership experience uh, when it's performed on us, right? Uh, our leader might not agree, but they can still functionally and effectively support us. And I think we might not necessarily agree with decisions by our leaders or with a path they take, whether it be in an operational strategic uh, or other uh, aspect of our experience as an employee or a team member, uh, but we can support them and, and do our best in delivering care to patients. And I think that's kind of a full circle way to answer that question, but it all applies to why not you, why not now? And I've never had to ask permission. It's not built into who I am. Uh, so I think that that's part of it too, is give yourself permission to go out and pursue what you know uh, could be a game changer or make the difference. Thank you for that. Um... And 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 and, uh, uh, and I appreciate you sharing your colleagues uh, the why not you why not now that's uh, um, and, and that's so true because so many uh, so many people don't necessarily step up and say yes choose me uh, so it's always nice to have that individual that sees the value and kind of gives you a little push to move a certain direction and that's where like mentoring and sponsorship really plays a huge role in the world of nursing. And I wish more people would uh, really actively engage with that process. Well, and if we wanted somebody to arbitrate change, innovation, technology, uh, the care of our patients, why not do it ourselves? Right. Uh, why not, why not, why not design the system and, and be, be effective uh, in, to benefit yourself and your colleagues and the community you directly serve. And there might be a side benefit of uh, you changing some component specialty or the whole of healthcare. Yeah, yeah, very true. Uh, and, that, and I think that's something that I, 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 I struggle with trying to communicate sometimes again with my students is that component of there's the profession of nursing and then there's your job in nursing. So some of that energy that you're spending, like being an entrepreneur or an innovator or trying to make change is happening. It's not. It's always nice to get paid for it, but it may be right. happening outside of your role and within the profession of nursing where you're not necessarily getting paid for it, but you're looking to 
change the process, right? And you're highlighting something that is absolutely essential. We need to lift each other up. I mean, one of the pillars of successful folks that I encounter uh, is that they somebody supported them uh, either by being solicited or or seeing the value they brought uh, uh, naturally. And I think that if we one of my mantras is recognition is retention um, that we I because I remember the first time I was written up for employee of the month positively and received that recognition. I mean, I can directly trace the success in my healthcare career to that one person, a direct line supervisor, taking the time out of their incredibly busy schedule to sit down and acknowledge me. And not only did I return the favor for doing it for folks that have worked for me ever since, because it's it's incredibly rewarding, but I have seen individuals, I can mark it out in time almost, those that have made a difference in my journey through recognizing me. And and if we see that and if we can absorb that, right, I think that we really can reclaim the agency for ourselves, our teams, and the profession as a whole, because you don't arrive at some phenomenal recognition spontaneously. It's usually a it's usually a an achievement built one brick or block at a time. And, and why not be the first, I mean, I would love to be the first block in anyone's wall with that recognition, right? It's easy to take the claim of being that last person to finish it, but being the foundation in building up someone else to achieve what they ultimately will, maybe well beyond your contribution 10, 20, 30 years down the line because of the momentum that was gained there. It is is huge and has incredible meaning to the profession as a whole. And we need we need to be able to get there uh, for for each other. And I appreciate you saying that. Uh, as I'm for our audience who's not actually seeing the visuals of this, I'm looking at Josh with uh, multiple awards on his background, and it's important that recognition piece is important. And I know you've been recognized several times. Uh, over the last few years, uh, but it really has to do with your engagement and your network, right? The network right. that you've built has allowed you to engage uh, on a national or international level, right? Um, what what's what's the driver for you in engaging in the profession other than you're invested clearly, but you continue to be uh, as invested in uh, in multiple organizations, right? Um, what has been the driver for you to do that? Because you've you have a network of individuals that you know you've published with. Uh, uh, you're you've been in leadership roles with multiple organizations. Um, what what's what do you think your driver is to do that? Well, I think it is. It comes back to the making a difference. Um, if you derive joy um, and energy from something you do, you're going to produce a better product, which means you're going to be asked to do more, which is going to raise your profile, which means you're going to achieve recognition, which means you're going to then be elevated to that next step. And I think that that's, that's not a invalid recipe. I do understand, and I have encountered them myself, barriers to the progress I thought I'd be making. Um, but the reason I stay as engaged in contributing is because there is value there. I find joy Everything I do has a purpose. And if you know, you probably have a copy of my CV there that I had to email you for this start of this. Um, everything on my history and my background has some sort of value for me, personally or otherwise. And so have being able to have that passion and point to why you did something. Um, you know, I don't I don't write to just write. That's like the most boring thing in the world. But when you're writing about, uh, for instance, uh, my article on COVID-19 and nurse leadership that I had the privilege of of writing with um, Dr. Christopher Stuckey and Dr. Marla DeYoung, um, you know, that that was my first uh, lead author piece. And it came to me. Nurses everywhere are leading in circumstances that are poorly defined. The challenges are opaque the imperatives and the directives from the government or other agencies or our own employers were changing on a monthly, weekly, sometimes daily slash hourly basis. Uh, Nurses are uniquely equipped to lead and be effective uh, in that kind of an environment. And so 
as we seek to define kind of those shadows in our experience as nurses and as leaders, who better to, you know, refine that skill set and then carry it forward post pandemic. Uh, and to me, I think that that's the kind of thing that's really kind of lit a fire for me is, you know, you leave the bedside. I, I last circulated in operating room, I think in 2017. Um, uh, for me, I've had a chance to, you know, support house supervisor teams and still go to the bedside um, seeking out leaders and clinicians to find out how the system is treating them as a system leader in health information, I I would routinely go to the the inpatient unit or the clinic to find out how the system is behaving uh, for them. And I, yes, I said the word behaving, not operating, because we all know that technology can really be a barrier to effective healthcare delivery. And when you think it about it under that context, transforming your own experience begins with helping others. And if you want to step it up to that next level and deliver for others, you first of all, have got to start by delivering for yourself and your patient right there and then. And then it just progresses on and upward. And I think when we really look at how do we elevate our message, you need to do it at the national level. Now, I can vouch for the fact, I have family members that would vouch for the fact that you do not want me to be a primary sponsor of a bake sale, because if I bake something, you're probably not going to want to purchase it. And if you did, you're going to just be donating money without the caloric benefit. But if, if you're listening to this podcast, somebody's out there listening to this podcast right now, and they know they want to make a difference, I would encourage them first to think about what's the difference they want to make. And at what level do they want to make it? There is no values judgment about where you put that effort in. It should be about you and your own satisfaction because you'll put in your best effort. Now, I'll tell you, if you, the whole concept of all politics is local, I would argue that some school board presidents have it just as bad as a national leader <laughs> because it's it's the same fight. It's just at a different scale for a different topic. Uh, and you might not want to read the newspaper uh, at the national level instead of just the local rag. But to me, I think that you really need to think about what's what's the outcome you want. And when I thought about the energy I had, I thought about the ideas I had, um, I was not going to be impressing three people at my local chapter meeting with it. They were strategic ideas. They were higher operational level ideas. So contributing at a regional level, a state level, and then having an opportunity to contribute at the national level was a, just a natural fit for who I am. And I think that that's part of everyone who's listening to this, it's part of their journey, is find your space. Because if you if you find your spot, then it's just gonna be a natural outgrowing of what you do. You'll put in your best effort and there'll be momentum and you'll have the opportunity to do more. But I would follow that up on by saying, you know, as somebody who has children and relationships that I want to nurture, um, also learn the word no, because especially in your 20s and 30s, um, it's it and, and the early phases of your career, which varies based on who we are and when we entered the profession, you need to, you know, pursue opportunity. And maybe you need to say yes, just for the nature of the experience and the growth and to fill in the resume. Uh, but at some point, start to figure out what you want to do because there's a countless folks that want you to do something. The question is, does, does it have meaning for you? Yeah, uh, and, and that's that's very true, uh, as you mentioned this, uh, because it, it I think it, was, it wasn't until like maybe three or four years ago that I really sat down on like, what are the, the, like the two or three buckets that really have meaning for me that I need to connect all my work to? And um, it was a difficult, it was, it was a difficult transition because it, it forced me to look at things more deeply yeah. in, in aligning because otherwise you're right, you get stretched uh, as it is, you're, everybody's stretched way too thin, but it, it even impacts you that much more where you're not, you're not passionate about a project and you're just not going to produce the quality of work that you can produce or you're capable of producing. Um, so very true. Yeah, and you only separate yourself through the quality of that output. It, 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 people are not particular about what you give them, but they can distinguish between quality 
and kind of a satisfactory job. Right. They want to see your flavor. That's what I love about you and our engagement over you know the years is you don't get a half dose. Oh, well, you don't you don't get a half <laughs> dose. <laughs> you you get a full dose. And I think I think if we can deliver that value in whatever activities are, um, other people will recognize that. And then it's a it's it's you can't assume you'll find success in everything, but um, delivering value is going to automatically create more opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you, by the way. Um, I always love, you're always very complimentary too. When, when, whenever we meet, you're complimenting me on something and I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, well and uh, you know, it's just, I'm jealous about, of your hair and uh, uh, need to get that on the right <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. I'll take any compliments I can get. Uh, so you mentioned something that triggered something for me and something uh, I rarely ask on my guests, but um, you 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 brought up the the concept of not succeeding or even I'll even put it like as failures, right? Sure. How what is your process in in not being successful in something that you may have been passionate about, or have you had that experience? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. We've we've all had that experience. I think uh, you know the context of it, uh, being able to forgive yourself, but also being realistic. It's fine to forgive yourself, but there's probably a reason that something occurred or that you had a a different outcome than you desired. So this is where I really, especially when engaging with my graduate students or with developing executives really practicing reflection um what led up to the circumstances that one might consider less than optimal what led up to it how could those have been shaped differently what were my direct uh, contributions or lack thereof uh, to the circumstances not just the outcome itself but like the actual circumstances where it finally gets adjudicated because most often when we identify gaps in what we wanted or needed or required, it could be resolved by a really effective, swift response. Um, and, and it only becomes kind of permanent and unre- irretrievable when it's been let linger for a significant amount of time. We, we want to forgive others. We want to grow others. We want to see our teams mature and, and effective leaders are transformational. They're, they have a culture of safety and learning and growth that that makes it safe and should make it safe to mature within that environment, which means you don't know everything, you're willing to ask questions, and you learn from your own actions. And I think the one thing I would push everyone towards is, is reflective leadership. Uh, what are you doing to reconsider even the successes, even the wild successes. Um, what are you doing to think on those, not in a congratulatory manner, but I promise you, even in your most wild success, there was a missed opportunity. And so for me, that's, I, I don't think I'm unhealthy about it, uh, but I for sure take the time to think about what could I have done differently and not so much forgiving oneself, but learning. Because I think, um letting it sting a little bit um uh having a scar is is not unappreciated people want to see that a leader has grown and had experiences that were suboptimal because we're all dying to know how you act when you're under duress we know you're amazing when everything's perfect and you're having your favorite beverage in hand and you completed your favorite dinner and the radio is playing your favorite song we know exactly uh, what that looks like. I know because every time the circle of life comes on, my four-year-old goes into a state of nirvana, you know, and starts, <laughs> starts doing an interpretive dance uh, with the circle of life and, you know, Elton John. So I think that let's, let's be realistic about where we want to go and let's, uh, be realistic about ourselves. And if you can be that way, you can land a lot softer and you can bounce. And, and we all want to bounce because if you don't bounce, it's going to be a lot harder because you have to climb up that much further. Yeah, I'm not very bouncy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I need to ask this question for more for 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 more more people because I, I I learned I learned quite a bit. Um, 
uh where but but it does it, but it, but it's true there are failures and i think we just don't share those failures right. as much uh with the people that uh um that could learn from our our failures or our shortcomings or whatever you want to call it, our yeah, and you, life and lessons you, and you don't have to be specific uh as a leader especially as somebody who's had the privilege of participating in leadership development for many junior managers and junior executives and and contribute my insights um you know first of all acknowledge that they have value whoever you are listening to this podcast you have value to bring to any circumstance as a clinician as a manager as a leader now you cannot control how someone else perceives you but you can inform their perspective and you can really work your best to not not in any way being defensive or justifying yourself, but let it be known what you're there for and what you're going to do and how you did it and 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 acknowledge others and you'll really be brought into kind of that circle of trust. If you need to share the details with your significant other, your closest friends, you know, try to do it with someone who won't carry the bucket of water around the corner and throw it on the wrong person because there's nothing more dangerous to individual leadership and corporate success for an individual than gossip, right? So the uh, make sure that when you share that pail of dirty water with somebody that you can both dump it out on the ground and let it absorb uh, <laughs> and, and leave the scene of the crime, so to speak, uh, and, and let it go. Because by sharing, you it has a cathartic effect itself. Um, but you also can reframe your own responsibility and you can usually have a plan for how you move forward. And I think that's the other part is discussing, um, especially we've all probably had to engage in corrective actions and in sitting down with someone and you've just gone through it, what is arguably one of the most challenging things as a leader, you've provided corrective action or insights to an individual. You don't have to agree that either one person or was more right or correct than the other person. But what we can agree on is where we go from here and how we hold ourselves accountable and we grow together. And if you can set aside the who was right, what happened, obviously, within certain bounds, of most commonly driven by law uh, and legal uh, counsel, um, then let's find a way forward together. And if we focus on the way forward together, only in the most extreme circumstances will we ever have to revisit that previous experience. I've been through some incredibly extreme experiences with shaping folks who worked for me. And only a handful of times have I ever had to go uh, back and revisit that later in, you know, in a kind of a termination action. It almost always results in the other person stepping it up and doing their best and growing. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, and that's that. And that's one thing about leadership that I, I don't think we have, we do enough to grow our leaders. Um, a lot of them is like, you know, you just go from step A to step B to step C, and we don't support our leaders in that growth process. It's just like, oh, you've been this for five years. Oh, you should, you're a great charge nurse. So obviously you're going to make a great manager or you're a great manager. You're obviously you're going to make a great director. And it doesn't work like that because it's a whole different level and we don't do enough to support to help with that growth um, and, and planning uh, for that growth. Well, and that's so, where we really need to also identify willingness within and across our teams. I firmly believe that a highly accomplished technical and clinical expert can be an incredible manager, but they have to have the knowledge and willingness to want to do it better right. than the previous person did. And I can look at a crop of managers and I can almost instantaneously identify over a very short period of time working with a group of managers who is going to be at least a candidate for that next leadership role because they have a desire to improve the processes under their control and they know that they can make it better both for themselves and for the team and for their customer or patient. Yeah. So to me, I think that our ability to shape that and, and to really own um, the growth of our teams and the feedback we provide to them also has the ability to inform our own growth as individuals because we don't succeed every time we sit down to provide that corrective counseling. 
We don't succeed every time we try to deliver an upbeat strategic message on why we're changing the operational posture for the third time this calendar year. We don't always succeed with those things, but we can really learn and, and move forward. Great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Um, I want to give you a few minutes uh, as we uh, and be, I'm cognizant of your time and uh, the time of our listeners. So uh, any, any, any words, what's, What's what's next for uh, for jo Dr. Josh Weimer? Well, I, I think I would just love for anyone listening to this podcast to really look at everything they bring to the table and understand that they can be the difference right where they're at right now. And ultimately, they can make a difference and move forward and have an impact in the future. And to me, you know, my journey began very humbly in healthcare. Um, and it's still a journey forward, right? I'm still pursuing impact. I'll probably be moving forward until the day I can't move forward anymore. So I would encourage folks to have that resilience and and practice the reflective uh, components uh, of what was discussed here. Because if you, if you realistically look at who you are, what you bring to the table, and you see me do this all the time <laughs> in our circles, like there's there's not a single reason uh, why we wouldn't get excited about anyone's ability, any individual's ability to make an impact on healthcare and the profession as a whole. And and for those that are listening, I would really encourage them to explore their passions. I I really wish that I would have started writing three or four years ago, and I was waiting for some sort of magical criteria to be checked off, right? A certain degree, a certain amount of experience, a certain role. And I realized that was never going to ultimately be self-evident. I just had to move forward. And, and my ideas needed to be out there and needed to be tested. And, you know, either, either we'll walk this idea around the block and it'll work out or we'll move on and, and pursue something else. And I think that if, if, if individuals have the boldness uh, to pursue uh, and, and and know their value, uh, I, I think that the sky is the limit. And, and when we look at healthcare, we look at the future, we look at innovation, there's nobody better than a nurse or any clinician or professional in healthcare to guide guide those uh, those steps along the way. And, and we do want to come back to uh, our own values and, and making sure if we're working with an organization that aligns to our own values, if we're participating in work that has meaning and value to us, it, it's not going to feel like work and, and we will succeed beyond our, our wildest imaginations. Very true. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for making time for us. Uh, and as always, I'm, I'm always grateful to uh, hear uh, what you have to say. So, so thank you so much. Uh, we have been listening to Dr. Josh Weimer, um, and uh, I look forward to bringing you more guests uh, as this season moves along. So thank you very much and have a great day. You've been listening to the RN Mentor with your host, Ali Taya. Please don't forget to visit www.aliartayeb.com. That's www.aliartayeb.com for podcast notes and resources. And don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, I wish you fair winds and following seas.